uh, probably maybe the mecca for colorectal surgery in Europe and uh, one of the few centers in Europe which are uh, which is recognized for tertiary care of complex uh, intestinal problems. His current position is the, he's a consultant colorectal surgeon at the St. Mark's Hospital and a visiting Garvin Institute, a visiting scientist at the Garvin Institute of Medical Research in Darlington in New South Wales. And he's also an honorary senior lecturer at the Imperial College London and a conjoint senior lecturer, University of New South Wales and Northwest Thames chapter representative in the ACPGBI, leading lead surgeon in inflammatory bowel disease and who is handling the intestinal failure unit at the St. Mark's Hospital. And he has got 95 full text in external publications tells you uh, but that he is a, a real academic as well, not only just a uh, surgeon. And he has supervised many uh, 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 higher uh, research degrees. And he has also had got some surgical innovations, which are transanal endoscopic mucosal resection of intestinal polyps, which is called the TASER. And the single incision combined with balloon enteroscopy for removal of small bowel polyps and specialty is a spe uh, he has also innovated the single incision surgery for complex Crohn's disease which has demonstrated reduced risk of conversion to open surgery and if i keep on talking about his cv i think it might take a long time so we have only limited time so can we invite uh, Janindra to deliver his presentation first and then after that we'll get the questions. People can put their questions on the chat line and actually I can tell you I was there for a short period on a Commonwealth uh, fellowship and the first case he did was, I don't know whether you can remember Janindra, was a chap whose BMI was about 35 who has had HIV positive, Hep B, <laughs> C both positive who has had a perforated diverticular disease and intestinal fistuli. I was petrified assisting you, but I mean, the uh, fellow was, had had two myocardial infarcts and uh, he went home after two weeks. So that is the type of skill that Janindra has. So let's invite Janindra to make his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very kind introduction. I'm not sure I deserve all of that. Um, is there any way possible I can share my screen? Yes, uh, you can. Uh, do you see the little square uh, down there in green color? Share screen? It says the host has disabled. All ah, right. Okay, probably. Now you should be able to. Uh, it's not disabled, but I think it just spawns a multiple uh, party uh, sideshow. You can now do it. Right. Lovely. Can you. Um, yes. It's not coming up. I wasn't sure. Um, um, I wasn't sure how long um, you wanted me to talk for. So I have a fairly long presentation, but we can uh, we can hold that uh, at any point because it's divided into various different sections. Um, I, I I was going to start off by actually um, uh, talking. Uh, a little bit about some of the problems we have in, in decision making, especially in the emergency setting or when managing complications and some of the issues that we have that, that might uh, uh, lead us to then having further complications. So it, it's, it's got to do with the decisions as to where we, where we uh, might consider an open abdomen. You know, do we do an early or late closure? How do we manage the wounds? And a lot of this comes about uh, in trying to also prevent entrocutaneous fistulas as, as, as much as uh, um, dealing with the problem as well. So we know that if, if a patient comes with uh, a septic shock in an emergency situation, the mortality is quite um, um, high and even after even higher. So you just need to keep that in mind. And the message there is that we shouldn't 
do multiple reoperating. And quite frequently, you will come to an impasse because there'll be an intensive care person who's always telling you you need to do another laparotomy because they don't know what else to do. They have got a radiologist, or you've got a radiologist who always tells you that they don't want to drain any collections. And as you say, you don't want to do an operation. And you get caught in this impasse because no one really knows what the right decision is. But if you, if you make the person who suffers the most out of any decision is the patient. We also have a, ha, there is a certain psychology that, that relates to decision making because if you have a complication, so if it's me and I have an anastomotic leak, I always fa have a feeling of guilt because you have, you've developed a relationship with that patient. You don't want to really go and talk to them about the fact that there's been a problem because they've put a lot of faith in you. Um, you then sort of worry that the family will criticize you and you go through this vicious cycle of then probably trying to make decisions to fix the problem rather than trying to see how we can damage control. And I think that's, that's where we need to be very careful. So a lot of people have these very conceptual treatment goals and that you want to sort out the problem, try and repair any anastomotic leaks, close the abdominal wall, starve the patients till any fistulas are healed. And that probably is the wrong way of looking at it. And I think we have to look at it in a much more pragmatic way or a much different way, which is try not to make the problem worse. If you've got a, any form of sepsis or leak, we we'll try and divert it, so be it radiological or surgical. Don't be afraid of keeping the abdomen open. Managing it can be difficult, but it's not entirely impossible. And where possible, you mustn't starve the patients, you must try and feed them. And enteral nutrition is something we're very, very big on here at, at St. Mark's. So the idea is that if you have a problem, do damage control rather than rather than uh, try and make the problem better where you would actually make it worse. Now, if you have to reoperate on someone, I always say you do not reoperate on someone in any way in that ten day to three month window. That is when that is when um, your the abdomen is at its most hostile. Well, if if you try to get in or try and separate bowel, that's where even the slightest movement will, will um, damage the bowel and damage bits that aren't, aren't damaged as well. So you could end up in a situation where you have a small anastomotic leak to having multiple different intracutaneous fistulas. So there's nothing, because if you, if you think about it very logically, if you have a situation whereby you have a densely ad adherent abdomen, which is the case you will get between from about 10 days to about three months. Any collection or any leak or anything will manifest itself as, as a pocket of collection, which in most situations are radiologically drained. We've managed to convince our radiologists um, e even to consider draining things by by putting a needle through the bowel, because in a lot of ways, that is a lot safer than actually doing an operation on these patients. I'm not gonna to dwell too much about abdominal compartment syndrome. I will um, uh, skip that because we don't have a huge amount of time, but maybe just talk to you a little bit about how I approach the open abdomen. So one of the, one of the things is that if you have a patient with an, uh, who's incredibly malnourished, uh, who's got ischemia or, or it has really active sepsis, I think you need to avoid an anastomosis in those patients. You, you, you have to really think very carefully about why you're gonna do an anastomosis in that patient. And bringing out a stoma temporarily is a much better approach than actually doing anastomosis and having a leak because those patients reserve is so limited that if you have any form of sepsis afterwards, um, you, 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 you're just gonna increase their mortality. So I always explain to patients about stomas and temporary stomas and I say it's, it's not something you're expecting or not something you want, but it is certainly something that's probably gonna get you out of a lot of trouble. Now, I'm, I'm sure this is not the practice in Sri Lanka, but, but certainly in, 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 in the UK and, and in certain other countries, 
there was a trend towards actually using polypropylene mesh, uh, especially in the situation of uh, trying to close uh, these abdomens that have been left open in the hope that you won't develop pneumonia. The big problem with polypropylene mesh in the presence of sepsis, and we've had a lot of issues with using uh, polypropylene mesh uh, in, in the pelvis for women, but leaving that aside, uh, the problem with using polypropylene mesh uh, is that if you have friable bowel and, and the bowel is very adherent to the mesh, you will get multiple fistulas as a result of that. So you're causing a problem that wasn't there in the first place. The other thing we say is don't use negative pressure directly uh, on the bowel. Again, that's another big no-no. And although there is some literature from the trauma setting whereby this has been done, um, it's not recommended because we, we have shown that um, there is a huge risk of uh, uh, intracutaneous fistulas again on, on these, uh, on these uh, where VAC pumps have been applied directly on the bowel. So what we want to do is avoid the temptation for multiple laparotomies. Ask yourself, what are you going to achieve by re-looking? re-looking once, twice, three times, what, what, what is the benefit? And if you feel that there's a really good benefit, by all means do it, but don't do it because some would say we're better off re-looking. And, and the third thing is damage control. So uh, you, there are a number of things you can do uh, and, and a lot of it will depend on the resources available and what you have available to you. You can just use a towel, put in some sort of elastic, uh, uh, so, some sort of sticky dressing, or even just so like a saline bag opened up, uh, something like that. But what you want is you want the fluid to drain out from those situations in the open abdomen. You can use negative pressure where they have this elastic sheet protecting it, and there's a dressing. Uh, I don't know if you guys have it available there called the Abthera, which is this plastic sheet, and then you put the negative pressure over it, so it, it takes up, takes away all the excessive um, uh, uh, fluid. Now, in terms of delayed closure, I always say, by all means, try it, but if it's not working, don't try too hard, uh, because you may not always achieve fascial closure, and you don't want your intensive care person saying, reopen it again, because... Uh, because uh, it's too tight. Uh, and uh, that you, you have to remember that the longer you leave it, the less chance you have of actually closing it. Sometimes you may just want to use a vicral or a biologic mesh to assist temporary closure. Uh, and the most important thing is you have to get your stoma care right, because you're gonna remember that these patients have a lot of, um, they have a lot of, um, crevices and misshapen abdomen for want of a better word. And they're gonna go through a healing process where the whole thing's going to change. And what you don't want to do is you don't wanna have this sort of situation where you've got a lot of burning because this is gonna be incredibly painful. You want to get it like this, where there is a good, lovely skin which you're not also gonna lose at the, at the next operation. This is a lady who came and saw me in clinic one day after having had an intracutaneous fistula somewhere else. And you can see that she was just managing it with dressings because none of the stoma nurses could actually deal with the situation. And you can see how burnt the skin was. And you can only imagine the agony that patient was in. But we managed to get that sorted out. Now, if you, if, if you remember, I told you not to operate on people within that 10 days to three months window. And actually we leave it six months. And you can see the evolution, if you like, of, of these patients with fistulas. This is sort of fairly early on and you can see a little bit of bowel, lots of granulation tissue. And as time goes out, the bowel starts to prolapse and it prolapses out more and more and the granulation tissue starts to settle. This is a good time to operate on a patient. It's a good time to operate on a patient because if you imagine this bit of bowel has now prolapsed, you can understand that there is a significant amount of, um, uh, 
or, or the adhesions are much, much less dense within it because it's allowed that bowel to prolapse. So therefore, you're going to have a much nicer operation than you would if you try to go in here and make matters much worse. So I, I'll come, uh, so um, it's about picking out the right uh, conditions for, for, for doing these. And it's basically when you have nicely optimized wounds. And you might not think that these are the same patients, but I promise you they are. So if you look at our intestinal failure unit, and this is slightly old data, but it hasn't really changed that much. You can see that for us, at least, the biggest source of referral are surgical complications. Um, and the second biggest is, is Crohn's disease. So um, you can argue that a significant number of these can actually be prevented. And that's why I sort of ha had my slightly preamble talk, because it, it is very important to try and, and manage these complicated surgical situations um, uh, as, as such. So we've got various periods in which we, we've uh, discussed. So we've talked about prevention a little bit, then there's the in-between period, what you do when you're waiting. Uh, because waiting is the most frustrating thing for those patients and it's the most frustrating thing for the surgeons as well. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, re um, uh, reconstruction. So there are some repeated messages because I think these are important to repeat, but I won't uh, go through that. Um, uh, and we'll come to this. So a lot of the times our patients get referred to the uh, intestinal failure unit and um, we go and have a chat with them and talk a little bit about surgery and then say, we'll go and see you again in six months time. Because although I said 10 weeks to three months, we know that the longer you leave them, the better it is. So we, 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 we definitely wait the, uh, we wait the six months because we find that that will give you much better outcomes in our patients. Now, I know everybody talks about um, SNAP, but we're, we're sort of, slightly different sepsis. We definitely like to um, control. Uh, you need to know the anatomy because in any discussion plus in any surgery that you're doing, you want to be able to understand the anatomy. And we would always have a discussion with um, the uh, radiologist and map the entire bowel so that we have a roadmap. Nutrition is massively important. So I've talked to you about enteral nutrition, and sometimes that needs to be supplemented with parenteral nutrition. And then that, that, all, that all comes into well, and the most important thing is exercise. You need these people fit. What happens is that if, you, if you've got a big wound manager on your abdomen, sometimes they don't want to walk because they're worried that it'll leak everywhere, and, and they do. And, they're not pleasant at all, but, but, and so they like to lie in bed all the time and you get a significant amount of muscle wasting. And one of the important things you have to realize is it's not just replacing calories. You don't want people with a lot of muscle wasting because what will happen is that they will replace a lot of their muscle wasting with fat. And, and so that, that even though you might say, oh, well, the weight's been stable or everything's been okay, you, you're not necessarily um, going to have the fittest patient. And, and so it is really important that, that these patients at least go home and, and uh, try and do some form of uh, exercise. So this is sort of our typical, um, uh, referral in hospital for about six months. Uh, uh, they've had an attempted repair, relook, they've been nil by mouth for ages, they're confined to bed, they're depressed, they've got abnormal liver function tests because of everything else going on, they have repeated line sepsis, they've got undrained pockets of sepsis and so on. And they can sometimes look like this. So what we tend to do is we let them eat, get them out of bed, get them moving around um, and, and they, they, they have to have a massive amount of support uh, psychologically because when they come to our unit, one of the first things they think about 
is they think that we're going to fix them fairly quickly. And, and they get massively disappointed when you say, yeah, we will fix you, but we're going to have, you're going to have to wait a little bit. You get, I say get the medical bit sorted out. That means uh, looking at all the liver function test issues, the nutrition, the so on and so forth. Get any, you said not always easy, but possible. Stoma care we've highlighted and I highlight it again and get them home, which also is not very easy. This is uh, not necessarily an intestinal failure case, but just to highlight to you that you can actually See, there's a, there's a collection here of a patient, young patient with Crohn's disease, and this is our radiologist actually draining it through the bowel this way with a small needle so that you reduce the risk of any fistula formation. If you put a drain through that, you will get a fistula, but otherwise you can actually drain these things and, and do damage control that way. We've talked about this. Um, and, and, and then the next thing is the bowel mapping. This is something you do when, when, you're, when you're waiting. And I think it's essential because it's essential that you have an idea of, of what you are going to do before the surgery, not only for yourself, but for, to be able to also talk to your patients about it as well. We might do barium follow-throughs, we might do CT or MRI. More commonly now we do CT and MRI. And sometimes you have to say we, we want a gastrograph and enema or something like that because the colon is out of circuit and you want to make sure that you have mapped every single bit of bowel that you possibly can. If you have someone with short bowel, it's always worthwhile thinking about anorectal physiology and ultrasound because it is not uncommon for, for those patients who get a lot of diarrhea and you might want to consider them having a colostomy. So, as I said, planning is massively important uh, and uh, you, you need signs like the prolapsing uh, loops of small bowel to sort of work out when to operate and that's basically it. So here you are, prolapsing loops of small bowel, they've got a couple of stomas, um, and then we come up to the reconstruction side. And you can see that what we're doing is we're taking every single bit down and, and you want to do a full adhesiolysis. You don't want to miss anything. Sometimes you can get a tiny little fistula or a tiny little hole that, that you may miss or may be missed on the radiology, especially if the fistula is proximal to that hole. And so you want to take everything down and, and have a very careful look through. When you do these, in, it's inevitable that you will get serosal tears and it doesn't matter how small they are, I think it is important that you repair every single serosal tear. And I, um, uh, Dax will tell you that I get pretty bored after dividing adhesions for the longest time and then I also, uh, get a bit tired and a bit grumpy. So um, the serosal tears are the ones that uh, I sometimes um, find the most tedious. And, and I know that that is my shortcoming. So I always get my registrars to go through the bowel very carefully uh, and, and, and to repair all, all, all the serosal tears because I know that in my hands, I'm more likely to miss them. Uh, and, and, and so it is really important that if you feel really tired or if you feel that you've concentrated for a long time and you're starting to get a little bit um, bored or not interested in the operation because dividing adhesions can be quite boring, then you need to get the whole team involved. So it's not very, it's not an operation that you just have to do exclusively and there's no shame actually in doing it as a team. And this is what the bowel will look like once you've reconstructed everything. And we tend to do a lot of hands-on anastomosis in these situations. Um, but, but there is no hard and fast rule as to whether you staple or hand sew. And then you can see that um, the wound, the abdomen can be quite tight because everything's being spread out like this and you're bringing things close together. So we tend to um, use um, uh, proline stitches to uh, uh, 
close the abdomen, keeping in mind that about 90% of these times, these wounds do open up. But the wound opening up is not a major problem for you, but it's a massive psychological hit for the patient because it's exactly what happened just before they got the intracutaneous fistula in the first place. So it is the time you have to be very caring, very reassuring and very there for those patients because the anxiety level is massively high because they feel, you know what, I've come here, I've come to get this thing sorted, I wanted a solution and now I'm back at square one. So similar sort of situation and you can see from this that uh, uh, the um, wound is uh, in, in a completely different direction. They've had the cut going this way um, and and so reconstructing this is not just about reconstructing the bowel it's also about how we deal with the skin and you can see like I said before when you start to get skin breaches you will get open areas of wound and this, this is entirely what uh, gives them massive amounts of anxiety and 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 keep in mind that you will get um, you will get intracutaneous fistulas recur. So even our healing rate is about 82%, which is pretty good, but that, that means that there are close to 20% of patients who will refistulate for a number of reasons. Now these data are from patients with Crohn's disease, and it is really what we do with patients about whether we join or not. And this is another important thing. When you have a patient in front of you, it doesn't matter whether they have Crohn's or not. You, you've, got, you've got to sit there and think about, am I going to bring out a proximal stoma? So for example, as ongoing sepsis cannot be controlled by radiology. The albumin is still sort of hovering down the low level and everybody says, oh, well, they probably need more PN and that's wrong. So, uh, um, make sure that you control your risk factors. And if it's, it's not a failure if you break out a high stoma in these patients and then come back um, at, at another time to, to do the definitive operation. But this is where the planning comes in because if you know this information beforehand, you can talk to them. Everything is about managing expectations. So this is a lady with multiple fistulas, very low albumin, uh, and uh, you can see that she's got this massive amount of Crohn's inflammation all stuck together. And this is exactly what we would do. Take this out, bring out a high stoma, and then come back another day to join them back. And then the post-operative management is equally as important as the pre-operative management. The first thing to do is not to fluid overload. These are not the sort of patients that you want to enhance recovery. You have to be very meticulous about their fluid balance because remember you've probably got about three or four anastomoses and multiple serosal tears. We start their parental nutrition very early. Uh, they will have a fear of eating and they will have a prolonged ileus. So you need, you need to manage that. Get them out of bed early and, and really monitor their albumin and CRP. And you will find that there is enough literature to you now have to see a trend. The problem you're going to have is you're on day one, you'll have a CRP of about 100. On day two, it'll go up to about 300. And that's the panic mark for all of us. But it's, you've got to measure the whole clinical scenario. So if it keeps going up and up and up, that's probably when you need to scan those patients. But keep in mind that the inflammatory reaction and the SERS response, as I call it, is massively high. So they're very hard to monitor. And it's not like doing an anterior resection and then monitoring the CRP. They're very different, but, but they can still give you the right indications. Now, just to sort of wind up then um, before we run into the discussion side, I thought I'll sort of quickly talk to you about uh, abdominal wall reconstructions. Um, they, they, this, is, this is also important because uh, you're going to find that bringing the abdomens together after an intracutaneous fistula is not always easy and tight. And you may need to think about various uh, reconstructive techniques such as abdominal wall reconstruction. So you, it, it's really important 
not to use um, non-absorbable meshes. I think that's probably the key message of all of these. And if, if uh, it's quite all right to bridge these with Vicryl or something else like I showed you before. And, and then you might find that you'll end up with a massive hernia that you can then fix later on with with uh, with uh, with a uh, absorbable mesh uh, we we can we tend to use um, not so much stratus now but nonetheless uh, a biological mesh because even if you have a massive wound breakdown the mesh will disintegrate uh, without causing major trauma to the abdominal wall i'm going to skip through some of these uh, but very happy to talk to you guys about complex abdominal wall reconstruction at a later stage. I wasn't really sure how much, but just to bring in some concepts about what we want to achieve from our patients as well. So if you are to con needing to construct these major abdominal walls, you can see this guy is incredibly fat. He's 200 kilograms. This is not going to work. So you really need to be able to bring... Um, uh, you need to be able to bring their weight down. There's a great app that can tell you what the risk uh, of the repair is based on various criteria and how much it's going to cost you uh, in US dollars, of course, which would probably be a bit cheaper in Sri Lanka, but still. So things like glucose control, weight loss, like this is that same patient. You can see how much weight they've lost. Uh, really very important stopping smoking massively important and then of course um, the weight uh, the nutrition as we've talked about probiotics we don't really use a huge amount but there is a case for that as well um, and and then if you manage some of those risks you can see that you can reduce the complication rates although just remember that when you consider minor and major complications, there's still a significant amount of complications associated with this type of surgery. So I, I, I won't talk to you too much about that. I just wanted to um, show you uh, some of the technical aspects of uh, what we do. Um, so, so here's a patient who doesn't have fistulas but has a big granulating wound. And my preference is to uh, use uh, um, uh, the transversus abdominis release. So we, uh, what, what you want to do is to achieve some sort of midline closure. So we actually go all the way uh, retrorectus and then release the transversus abdominis muscle, uh, close the posterior sheath, and this is the posterior sheath closed if possible and then place a mesh. This, this one is called BioA. It's a biosynthetic mesh, which is a lot cheaper than the, um, than the uh, biological meshes. And then if possible, close the anterior sheath. So you've got like a sandwich over it, but if you can't, at least you've got your posterior sheath closed and then close the wound. And that seems to give us best results. Um, uh, and, and, and also, what we tend to do now is to use negative pressure wound dressings as well, um, uh, which helps reduce our infection rate quite massively. Um, and uh, Dax will tell you that it's a pain to put in and I always leave it to the registrars because if it doesn't work, at least you can blame him for it. Um, but, 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 they do, but they do work very well because it gives you seven days of negative pressure, not at the same level as with the black uh, vac dressing, is that uh, you suck out all of the exudate from around the wound and, and reduce the um, wound infection rate, but you're not in direct contact with the bowel. And it's certainly been... Uh, one of the WHO recommendations as well in their, in their more recent infection control or uh, uh, SSI guidelines published uh, early last year, I think. So, and, and you might need your friendly plastic surgeon if you really can't reconstruct these by yourself, which might require flaps or anything else. Uh, or some surgeons tend to use the plastic surgeons to finish the abdominal wall reconstruction, because you keep in mind these can be very, very long operations. 
So I'm going to sort of finish there and we can have a good discussion, but just remember damage control, don't, don't reoperate in that window period, really optimize the patient. And even after six months, if you feel that the patient's not optimized, make them, I'm sorry, you're not ready for it. Uh, and it's not easy for the patients to take, but it, it, it's, you, you have to have a conversation with them about that. And then finally, it's about doing the right reconstruction with the right planning uh, and making sure that you don't cause more problems than are already there. So those are the principles and thank you for listening. Thank you, Janendra. So I think we'll take questions till you all gather your thoughts. Can I just ask you one, uh, two questions, please? Yeah. Now, what about, what is the role of, no, uh, of uh, feeding through the distal loop. Some people say if you can see the two loops, there is always, uh, it's a good thing to feed through the distal loop, take the fluid from the proximal loop and push it into the distal loop. Yeah, so I, I didn't mention that in great detail, but uh, um, it's something that uh, um, we are sort of great believers in and we do a lot of, now we can do. You can reinfuse the chyme, which is not always pleasant, uh, and and uh, the patients don't tend to like collecting their chyme and then reinfusing it. But there is this new gadget, and I must say I haven't got a picture of it yet, but I must get one for my next talk, where where there is a little pump that sort of sits inside the storm bag. And, and literally it, it collects all of the chyme as it comes in and pumps it through a tube into the distal limb. So you don't actually have to handle the, um, handle the um, chyme at all. Now, if you can't reinfuse the chyme, then what we tend to do in most of our patients is just add some feed, like about 150, 200 mils of feed in a day through a already pre inserted tube that stays in the distal limb. There are a number of, uh, there are a number of situations um, where you wouldn't want to, if you feel that you've got an intra-abdominal collection because there is still an intra-abdominal fistula, then you don't want a distal feed because you'll only make that worse. Um, I, I think that would be the main thing. Or if you have distal obstruction, which you haven't still dealt with, uh, such as a crone stricture, then then that's another situation where you wouldn't want to do distal feeding. Otherwise, I think in most situations that would be very good. Um, the the major advantage of distal feeding is that especially if you feel that the gut's going to be lying dormant for quite some time while you optimize the patient, or even if it's not, you will find that your return to bowel function is much faster. Um, in uh, uh, return to bowel function much faster in these patients if they're already distal fed because that bowel is in its better trophic state. Um, and we believe, although there's some research going on at the moment, so no results yet, but we believe that it also adjusts the microbiota to the point that you reduce the complications, as particularly anastomotically complications. Anybody else who has got a question? You can raise your hand and they will let you in. Okay, then other thing is actually, Janindra, what about the radiation induced enteritis and multiple fistule? You know, we know well, when patients get radiation enteritis, the intestine has failed, the small bowel. Now, however much you sort of uh, uh, try to sort of do surgical intervention it may not work it may not leave but then the intestines are not working so in that situation do you send them on uh, parental home parental nutrition and what is the status so so i think radiation enteritis is one of those very hard things because once you operate on them just more problems than it's worth. And uh, um, you might get more fistulas, more strictures, and so on and so forth. I don't think that it's, it's a reason not to operate on someone, especially if they've had pelvic radiotherapy. You might 
for example, consider bringing out high fistula uh, or, or you might want to resect a certain amount of bowel that's sitting in the pelvis and, and, and hope for the best, enjoy them and keep them on the short side. But inevitably, the, if, 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 they are, if they are dependent on, um, on parenteral nutrition to supplement them, then it is home parenteral nutrition that, that would be necessary. Any other questions? Actually, Americans have divided the, these things into two. I think some of the American books give enterocutaneous fistula as a separate entity and enteroatmospheric fistulae, which are coming through the open. Do you consider both as one or? I think it's the same. I think it's, it's the same pr uh, problem. So I, I don't get to, to, uh, Caught up on the, in the compl uh, classification. Anybody else? Yeah, these are golden opportunity for you to ask questions and clarify any doubts you have. I'm sure you all would have found several patients, especially gunshot injuries, which are quite common here. Trap gun injuries and the people coming after being shot with so so i think i think trauma is much different to um or at Same. least you can you can uh, it's much different to surgical complications because it's the timing isn't it you 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 um uh, usually if you deal with um, a, a, a surgical complication that patient has been septic for way longer or, or they've had a problem for way longer than when you recognize the problem. Uh, because I think that you get a leak well before you see the manifestations of the leak. A and so if you consider it that way, your damage control is much, it can be much different to if you have an acute injury which you're going to deal with very quickly. And you can probably take more risks uh, in those patients with acute injuries than you, than you can sure. uh, with uh, the surgical complications. And this is where the big debate came about back dressings and all of those. The bowel isn't friable because you, it hasn't been exposed to that massive microbiome for, for such a long time. And, and, and the more we start to understand about anastomotic leaks, the more we realize that it is perhaps not appropriate to just say that it's a problem of blood supply or a problem of tension, that it's a problem also of the microbiota um, and, and, and therefore uh, um, I think probably in the next five to 10 years, uh, we, we, will, we will get a much better handle of who is at risk of anastomotic leak, maybe even by assessing their microbiota beforehand and treating them appropriately. Thanks, Janine. When a patient comes or referred to your unit and they land in your hospital, how do you assess the patient regarding the further management? I mean, what is the sort of criteria you use? Do you use any scoring systems or do you get down all the people, nutritionists, the nurses, everybody? So, um, it's very much multidisciplinary. It's not. Uh, it's not in any way um, um, that we have a scoring system. So uh, there is a huge amount of stuff that has to be done from the moment they come in. Um, they've usually spent a considerable amount of time in the other hospital, which means that they are suddenly going to come in, and we're going to change all the systems. Uh, now that can be good or bad because if they've had a really bad time and suddenly there's a system that works and someone says, oh, we're going to change the system, they start to get very anxious. So managing the psychology, as I said, is a big part of the whole thing. But we have a team of uh, pharmacists, dietitians, uh, intestinal failure physicians, us as the surgeons, um, um, and, 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 and a whole liaison team. That, that will go through every aspect of that patient's care. 
uh, nutrition nurses uh, that will go on uh, will go through every aspect of that patient's care, and then um, work out a very comprehensive plan. And so we have a weekly MDT as well. That means that we do, including the ones who are not in hospital. Are they there in the hospital right throughout? No, so that we try we try very hard to get them home when they're stabilized on home parental nutrition. Now, we're very lucky that we have the ability to have home parental nutrition in the UK. In Australia, for example, they don't have a sophisticated home parental nutrition system. So either those patients spend a lot of time in hospitals. Um, uh, although I have to say, when I was practicing in Australia, I didn't see the same volume as as we did in the UK, and I'm never really sure what the what, why why that is. Is it just that everyone's doing bad surgery in the UK, or is it uh, that uh, maybe we notice this more? Or those patients that have a higher mortality in those countries that don't have um, a sophisticated system. I honestly don't know what the answer is. There is a question from. Dr. R. N. Samarasingha, any place for external dressing without surgical intervention? Any promising global data? What, what do you mean by ex external dressing without? Can the person say what he means by that? What probably he must be, what he meant probably was probably without doing any surgery. Can you just use the dressings or vac dressings or whatever for these patients? Oh, oh, for, for closing the fistulas with uh, vac. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Um, no, not really. I mean, a certain proportion will just close on, on their own accord if they're very small, if there's no distal obstruction, a certain proportion will close. And we, we, we do watch them. Um, close. Um, I, I wouldn't recommend using VAC over them, uh, although there are a few people who suggest that one should. I, I would say just use a stoma bag and watch them close. If it's a low volume fistula, there's a reasonably high chance that they will close. But if it's a high volume fistula, it's unlikely that it will close. He is asking again, sorry, any ablation methods? Can the person clarify what he means by the ablation? There are, uh, there are um, various surgical clips that you can place endoscopically. Success rates are very minimal, work much better in things like gastro, gastrocutaneous fistulas, uh, but, but less so um, in, uh, in um, uh, small bowel fistulas because accessibility is always an issue. But again, they've got to be very small holes. The small holes are much easier to treat than the larger ones. Yeah, any more questions, please? I think it's a. Yes, ask another. Anybody else, please, on the chat line? No, nothing. Dakshita, you have been there for over one year, so I think you must be having... You can answer all the questions. <laughs> Again, Mohan Dias, he's asking, any use of laser therapy for these? Not, not in my experience. I don't, think, I don't think we can. I mean, we use laser. I use a lot of laser for the anal fistulas. Um, with what I would say probably mixed success. There are some that heal, some that don't, but um, not, not for the intracutaneous fistulas. Any more? Before we wind up for... He must be having more work to do anyway. If there are no other questions, uh, Janinder, thank you very much for giving us one hour of your busy schedule to make this presentation. And I also must thank the College of Surgeons, uh, 
Jayendra, the president, is Jayendra, who has sort of uh, who is running the show at the moment, and also Dakshita for organizing this uh, Zoom meeting, and the non uh, and the administrative staff of the uh, College of Surgeons. Uh, I think it's Erdly who is there uh, conducting this with the multimedia, and uh, since. There aren't any other questions. I would probably call it a day. Anything Thank else? You. Thank you very much for having me. I, I wish I was there. As you, a <laughs> you are anyway there all the time. You are coming to Sri Lanka, so two, three times. So I'm waiting for you to be Sri Lanka. <laughs> okay, thank you.